Local programming on KRWG made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Your Legislators, a production of KRWG Broadcasting. Your Legislators is a public service program providing our viewing audience in southern New Mexico the opportunity to hear about important legislative issues directly from their elected representatives in Santa Fe. Thank you for joining us for Your Legislators. I'm Fred Martino. We're very pleased to have with us today on the program Senator Ron Griggs, who joins us from Santa Fe. Thank you for being with us today, Senator. Good morning, Fred. It's great to have you here. So uh, give us your sense so far of how the session is going. We'll be closing this up in just a few weeks. And uh, I know there have been uh, a lot of disagreements. There also have been some agreements, some things passed. Uh, what are the highlights for you? You know, Fred, we're about to get to all of them. I mean, the, the way the legislature works is that, you know, a lot of bills are introduced, a lot of moving around but you come toward the last week or two and you get all those bills coming to the floor where you have the, you know, the d opportunity for everyone to debate their pros and cons. Yes, and of course, uh, one of the bills I know that's before the Senate is the House budget bill. The House uh, passed a, a budget and also passed some revenue uh, measures, uh, taxing all internet sales, uh, raising the permit fee on heavy trucks, uh, closing a loophole that benefits nonprofit hospitals and healthcare providers, and then also increasing the tax on vehicle purchases from three to four percent. There's been a lot of resistance to this among Republicans. Uh, give me your thoughts on that plan. You know, Fred, the bill that's come out of the House, which that's that's House Bill 202, and I haven't I haven't read the the full text of the bill to to know. Uh, exactly what it's going to do. Our hospital over in Alamogordo, uh, Gerald Champion, they have some real concerns about the way the thing is put together and the impacts it's going to have on them and their ability to provide uh, the care that they, uh, they intend to provide to the citizens of Alamogordo and Otero County. So I think as that bill moves forward, and it's in, it's in Senate finance right now, so we'll see what comes out of there. What, what happens in the, in the process is the bills, once they pass the House, they come over to the Senate and go to one or two committees. This one is, I believe, in Senate finance, and those Republican and Democrat senators that sit on that committee will then be charged with finding out, well, how do they believe that bill should be put together, should there parts of it that come out, uh, should there be parts that stay in, then it will move to the floor for the, the full debate. So the only input I have on that bill is with uh, other Republican senators on the Finance Committee, and we have not had a chance as a group to caucus and talk about just exactly how that bill looks to people. Okay, there's been another proposal uh, by a Republican, uh, and this proposal is very, very different. It's a sweeping reform of the gross receipts tax, changing it to a, a sales tax, uh, eliminating lots of different uh, exemptions, but it has, as you know, a very controversial provision, which is to return the uh, sales tax on groceries. Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on this? You know, what New Mexico needs is sweeping reform like that, whether it's that particular bill or a bill that's been pushed by Senator Bill Scherer from Farmington. Those are, those are two different approaches, but they completely redo our tax structure and system in order to provide revenue to the state and reduce reliance on, on oil and gas. Representative Harper's bill is, uh, is quite a piece of work. It's 300 and some odd pages long makes a variety of changes to the to the tax code. Uh, you're absolutely right, it puts the tax back on food and there's been a lot of discussion about that. And I want to, I want to elaborate not just maybe on his, uh, on his proposal, but on the tax on food when you look at it uh, uh, by itself. The tax on food uh, was removed in 2004 
as a, um, well, I think in, in many ways it was a political uh, opportunity for then Governor Richardson to, uh, to help him promote the fact that he was a tax cutting Democrat governor and, and gave him an opportunity to uh, promote his presidential politics. But uh, when that happened, cities and counties were then held harmless. So the state of New Mexico has been paying cities and counties their share of gross receipts tax that they would have received from food. So right now, those numbers are somewhere around $100 million that the uh, state of New Mexico pays out to municipals and counties without getting any revenue in. So that's one of those items that's out there, regardless of uh, Representative Harper's bill, is what should we do with those hold harmless payments? If we stopped them, New Mexico's budget uh, deficit right now, which is a little over a hundred million, is almost filled by reducing that hold harmless payment. So you've got that that sits out there. Uh, you got a lot of other things that are out there floating around. But uh, but Representative Harper's bill is a is a remarkable piece of work. It's. Um, uh, I don't know whether it's something that's going to pass because it's so hard to get your arms completely around it, but it is, it's what ultimately New Mexico needs, something along those lines, so when, then we can promote our state to, uh, to the nation and say New Mexico. New Mexico is really open for business. We've changed the way we do business in order to bring you here with a much simpler, uh, more easily understood tax code and policy. Now, of course, uh, as you know, with all of these plans, there, there is a big if, and that, that big if is what will it happen, what will happen when it goes to the governor? She has said that she will uh, veto uh, new taxes, but she, she's open to the idea of closing some tax loopholes. Where do you see this situation right now? And, and are you fearful that there might be a situation where vetoes occur and then you have to come back for a special session to fill a, a, another, another budget hole down the line. You know, Fred, I'm, I'm hopeful that we solve the problem, but, uh, but I think it would be unrealistic to not, uh, not believe that a special session could be coming. Uh, if we work hard and get some of the right answers and the governor uh, is then willing to address uh, Maybe, maybe some enhancements, uh, we'll, we'll see. But I think the only way you're gonna see that from the, from the governor's perspective is if there's some other, uh, you know, some spending cuts, some other things that allow us to, uh, to do some of one and some of the other. Just, I think, straight, uh, straight tax increase is gonna be very difficult for her to swallow. Okay, as you know, uh, some of your uh, colleagues have also uh, supported a, an, an increase in the state's gasoline tax uh, by 10 cents a gallon. Uh, and proponents of this argue, look, the, the gas tax hasn't been raised for more than uh, two decades. Uh, we have inflation, uh, and inflation affects the cost of building roads and other infrastructure. Uh, but there has been a lot of resistance to this. And in fact, the, the governor's uh, office said uh, through a spokesperson, if this came to her desk, she'd veto it. You know, Fred, I voted against that bill yesterday on the Senate floor. And the, uh, the gasoline tax is one of those that's really hard to measure because you believe that it'll go up. But, you know, people reduce their, uh, their driving, they change their habits, they buy different cars. Uh, is it a good deal, is it a bad deal? I, I don't know that it actually generates the revenue you hope. But in this particular bill, the revenue wasn't all going to roads. The revenue raised a good chunk, most of it, was going to, uh, uh, to our reserves to, if, uh, if to the build revenue, that up. Yeah, if the revenue was going to go all to the roads and to other infrastructure affecting transportation, uh, would that be something that you could support based on, again, the notion that we, we always have some inflation and th this hasn't mm -hmm. been raised for several decades. Uh, I, uh, about 20 states around the country were in the same uh, position as New Mexico in the last few years and they decided, uh, many of them with Republican uh, controlled legislator legislatures, to raise their gasoline taxes. 
Well, Fred, let's talk about that for a second. The raising of this gasoline tax raises uh, 10 cents, I believe, raises about $180 million, something along those lines. Uh, right now, currently, and and I'm, I'm mistaken because they also added an increase to the uh, motor vehicle excise tax, which raised about 50. So I'm guessing they're thinking that the gas tax raises about 130. So if you, if you look at where you've got right now with your motor vehicle excise tax, your motor vehicle excise tax is 3%. It raises $150 million. If you add another 1% to that, well then you have a $200 million revenue generation from uh, motor vehicle excise tax, which is pretty consistent. It doesn't, you know, maybe doesn't fluctuate and doesn't have the real uh, opportunity to go down. You're still well below, at that point, well below other states who charge a motor vehicle excise tax. Uh, if you were to take, and what, what happened is years back, the legislature chose to move the motor vehicle excise tax from the road fund to the general fund. If that were back in the road fund with that 1% one, uh, 1 raise, well then that's $200 million to the road fund. So you're saying you that you that. actually would prefer that uh, roads and other infrastructure for transportation come out of that pot rather than the gasoline tax? Fred, I think that's a better approach because I think it's more consistent mm -hmm. and it allows you to plan better and operate better. Now, should you also maybe uh, tweak the gas tax some? And maybe you could. Maybe you could tweak it a little bit and you say that if the price goes up to a certain number, well, it drops back down because when people look at gas taxes, and you know, we talked about the food tax a minute ago, but if you talk about gas tax, something that's fairly regressive, it, it then causes the poorest of the poor in a lot of ways to have to spend more just to get to work. Uh, then they don't have any help. Uh, the guys on, uh, on food stamps or so, the increases in the food tax may not bother them too much because they're not taxed on it. They have, uh, they have food stamps. So if you put it on gasoline, though, nobody gets around it. Okay. I want to ask you about the larger implications of, of looking at tax policy. And, you know, gasoline is just one where uh, the gas tax, as I mentioned, hasn't been raised for, for more than uh, two decades in, in New Mexico. Uh, and this notion of inflation. This hits in, in a lot of areas. Uh, another area where it certainly hits involves uh, employee salaries. And we have that situation uh, in the state of New Mexico that uh, a long period with little to no cost of living adjustments has resulted in, in a very difficult situation in certain sectors. Uh, chief among them, the schools, where in, in Las Cruces public schools, for instance, mm -hmm. a starting teacher makes $34,000 a year, and just down the road in El Paso, the starting pay is, in various districts, ranging from forty-five dollars to $48,000 a year, and they're talking in, in Texas, in those districts, some of them about another increase. Uh, so you, you have a difficulty then attracting uh, teachers into, into districts that pay much, much less. And you can't make it up all in one year. Uh, so give me your sense of this, this notion that if tax policy doesn't follow at least minimal inflation, over time it builds up into these enormous gaps. You know, Fred, those are, those are very valid questions on, well, what should you do and how should you, how should you do that? Uh, you know, New Mexico, all in all, the cost of living in New Mexico is less than surrounding states. Uh, so does, how does that make us ultimately compete with, uh, with El Paso when you talk about salaries? Uh, Las Cruces does have the challenge of having El Paso there so close. Uh, over in uh, Clovis, they have Lubbock fairly close. Uh, it's a, you know, it is a real challenge, but what we've got to do in New Mexico somehow, some way, is we've got to figure out how to drive the economy differently so oil and gas does not play the role it plays because we, we don't have the revenues 
in order to uh, to track people here, businesses here, that then bring bring jobs and make your economy more productive, make your um, uh, your tax base better, make more money come into the uh, to the state, which allows you to do some of that stuff. You uh, you know the pie if the pie doesn't grow, pie doesn't grow, the individuals in the pie uh, have to pay more for the same things. And at some point in time, what you do is, and what happened in New Mexico, is we're losing people. So we lose people to participate in the, in the pie making, so to speak. And so the guys that are here, the cost on them grow. It, it becomes just a, you know, a big, big circle, big, big tough deal that if you don't make that pie bigger, if you don't have more people paying in, you're going to have a, a much harder time providing for those people that uh, receive benefits through the way your your pie is structured. Yeah, you know, and as you know, one of the ways to increase that pie that was uh, proposed by a number of different folks in the legislature this year was to legalize, tax, and regulate cannabis. But that now looks to be <laughs> dead. Uh, your thoughts on this? Well, Fred, it's, I would tell you it's not dead in that uh, there's a, a cannabis bill coming to Senate Judiciary this afternoon. And uh, I would imagine just paying attention to the structure of that committee that there's a very good chance that that bill passes and moves to the floor. Now, it's already died in the House, so does it have a real, real lifespan? I can't say that it does, or I really don't know if it, it doesn't. But uh, that is one of those issues that, boy, there's a lot of sides to that and how you do it and uh, if you do it. Well, and, to, it was, uh, and it was another one of those issues, too, where, uh, you know, it, it, uh, on the outside, a lot of folks looked at it and said, why is a lot of time being spent on this when the governor has not indicated that she would uh, allow this to avoid her, her veto pen. Uh, now, there, there was other legislation that would have, would have avoided that threat by just taking it straight to the voters with a constitutional amendment. For, for the folks, regardless of where you stand on it, because I believe you're against this, this notion uh, of legalizing cannabis for recreational use, um, is that the approach that should be taken? I mean, in, from a practical matter? You know, Fred, I believe that we talked about this a little bit in a, in a forum that we mm -hmm. had. Um, and all of us, at least all the senators there, said we thought, we thought that it would be better discussed as a bill and not as a constitutional amendment. Correct. Uh, and the reason, the reason for some of that is, is then if the amendment is passed, then the challenge that you've got is trying to put together legislation very, very quickly. Uh, this is, you know, this is something that needs to be pretty well thought out and addressed. I mean, you know, we can, we've got other go-bys. We've got Colorado, we've got Washington, we've got others. But we also, in this day and time, we don't quite know where the federal government's going to come down on some of this. What are, what are their rules and regulations? Are they going to enforce them? And on, along know, those lines, Mar yeah, along illegal. those lines, Senator, is that an argument in your in your view for a constitutional amendment? Because <clears throat> it's it's a way for New Mexicans to speak directly to the federal government as to whether they agree or disagree with legalizing marijuana. Since since if, if it passed, mm -hmm. it would it would disagree with federal law. Well, Fred, I mean, I think this is an excellent time, and an ex you know, as you look at you look at the country and you look at the way people are looking at things and other places legalizing marijuana, maybe now's the time that the federal guys step up and address the issue as well. Okay, well I wanna ask you uh, quickly about another uh, issue related to taxes and substances, alcohol and tobacco. Uh, taxes uh, have been proposed to increase for both alcohol and tobacco again. Uh, polls show that, that these uh, tax increases are very popular with the public. And, and as you know, uh, many pu public policy experts say uh, this is a good idea uh, because it's a way to ensure that those substances which cost the government money at least pay 
somewhat uh, of a more fair share of those costs back through the tax revenue. What are your thoughts? You know, I haven't, again, I haven't seen those exact bills, but the, the challenge again with that stuff, those are, you know, the sin taxes that, you know, people like to talk about. Uh, you know, at some point, where do you, where do you lose revenue on some of that? You know, do you drive it, do you drive it uh, across the state line? What, what do you do? So I think you have to be careful in how you look at it. Those, those two particular instances are, are pretty strong lobbies. There will be a lot of interesting discussion when you start talking about raising taxes on, uh, on uh, liquor and raising taxes on, on cigarettes. But, uh, you know, we've also got uh, a bill, I think we've got it here pretty soon, dealing with uh, e-cigarettes and changing some of the stuff with them. So uh, the bills, Fred, one of the, one of the things, we can, we can talk about a lot of stuff philosophically, but when we see the bill, the bill may have a, have a title that gets you excited about it and may make it, make it sound really reasonable. But as a lot of people will tell you that the devil's in the details and making it right becomes the real challenge on some of those things. I know you proposed a bill this session that's gotten some support related to alcohol, which it, it would allow folks, if a restaurant allows, it would allow folks to bring uh, their own bottle of wine uh, to a restaurant. Tell, tell us about that. Uh, Fred, that bill's sitting over in the House waiting for its first committee hearing. It, uh, it passed the Senate. Uh, it certainly seems to be a reasonable uh, bill because it doesn't mandate anything, doesn't require anything, gives businesses the opportunity to choose, but it's, it's gathering a little bit of resistance in the House. So we'll, uh, we'll see how it moves forward, but it, again, if a restaurant decides they want to do it, they can do it. If they decide they don't want to do it, they don't have to. Well, speaking of restaurants and other service industries, lots of concern, and you've expressed uh, to some reporters uh, concern about this, proposals to increase the state's uh, minimum wage. Uh, this passed in the Senate uh, with little Republican uh, support, a, an increase to $9 an hour. Uh, tell us about why you oppose this. Well, I didn't. I actually signed on to that, uh, on that minimum wage uh, uh, bill. And you voted for the, it. Uh, the other minimum wage bills are going to be devastating to, you know, to small business. This one's going to be hard enough. But at the same time, you know, New Mexicans, New Mexicans, we don't, we don't have a lot of uh, high paying jobs. And then we don't, we have people that, uh, that are unable at this time to, uh, you know, to gain high paying jobs. So you, so you we support need fair I want, jobs. I just want to make clear. So you, you were one of the, just a few, I think it was three Republicans that, that voted for the, the increase to $9 an hour. I hope there were a few more of us, but I, I was one of them. Okay. All right. Well, that's very interesting. So where do you, I mean, do you think that this will, if this hits the governor's desk, do you think that this, this will go through then? You know, a couple of years ago, Governor Martinez indicated that she would have signed a, uh, a minimum wage bill that was, I think it was $8. Uh, I don't know whether, whether the governor will, will sign this bill or not. Uh, I think that the bill is, is problematic in some ways. Minimum wage bills are problematic. Uh, but my hope is that as it moves forward in the House, there might be a few things that can be done to it that make the bill stronger and better, and then combined with some other things that come up and come out, maybe she'll be able to, uh, to believe these are good approaches for New Mexico. Okay, uh, another uh, bill that came forward uh, that, that passed uh, in the Senate, but it had uh, little Republican support, was uh, a change to voter registration. This would be a way to allow folks to register to vote uh, as close as three days before an election. Now I believe it's 28 days. Um, and it, it, there, were, there were, was a lot of opposition to this among Republicans. What, what are your thoughts about this? You know, one of the most sacred things that we do in this country is we, is we exercise the right to vote. 
your responsibility, my responsibility is to, is to vote. One of the things that we have got to be assured of, though, is that a guy who is intending to vote is, again, I, I don't want to use the properly vetted type stuff, but, but a guy's had, had the, the opportunity to show that he was here uh, legally and that uh, he had changed his residence legally and three days just doesn't give us enough time. And I, uh, I believe that uh, Senator Steinborn, you know, who carried the measure, uh, obviously disagrees with that, but I don't believe that's enough time. And I think, I think we as, as Americans, you know, if we're going to do some of this stuff, sometimes we need to take the responsibility to get our job done a little quicker so we don't have to worry about, uh, uh, well, I just get there at the last second and I can, I can register. It just it shouldn't work like that. Do you think, Senator, that uh, if we're going to keep it at 28 days uh, before the election, uh, the, the deadline for registration, do you think that some of New Mexico's filing uh, deadlines, both uh, on the local level and maybe even the state level, but especially the local level, should be earlier? Because, you know, as you know, critics argue that a lot of times if the filing deadline is not long before the election, Folks don't even know who the candidates are until a, a week or two before the election uh, anyway, uh, especially in things like school board elections. Well, Fred, let's talk about turnout at school board elections. Let's talk about it at, at municipal elections. Your turnout is, is very, very small. Uh, and sometimes these guys indicate that, well, this should help make turnout better. You know, I again, I go back to the responsibility of the voter. I'm not sure that I believe that these things will increase voter voter turnout, but you may have a you may have a point about the fact that uh, you file for city offices 60 days before the election, and uh, is that enough time? Maybe it's not. Maybe I know journalists say it's days. not. <laughs> <laughs> we want we want more time to 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 cover and and I'll have uh, forums and discussions like this. Well, Senator. I really appreciate you taking a half hour of your time today, and I know your constituents approve, uh, appreciate it as well. Uh, and thank you for, for taking the time, because I know you're very busy up there. Well, Fred, thank you for, for doing this, and you know, let's see how the last two weeks play out. All right, thank you so much. Have a great weekend. You too, thank you, Fred. Thank you at home as well. I hope you have a great weekend. We'll see you next week on Your Legislators.